Broadcasting from the studios of WKEN, where every day it's the weekend. It's the Ken Calvert Show with your host, Ken Calvert. Hi, everybody. It's Ken Calvert, and welcome to the Ken Calvert Show podcast. I get up every morning about 6 o'clock, do the same thing we all do, email, Twitter, Facebook. I read a lot every day about uh, music history, and I usually try and post something that I hope people may find interesting. Well, invariably, as I'm going through Twitter and Facebook, I see a fresh post five days a week from Fred Jacobs. Now, if you're in media, any media-related occupation, and especially radio, you know the name Fred Jacobs. Jacobs Media really is the gold standard within our industry, and I met Fred back in 1980 at WRIF in Detroit. He was a, a research director and then my program director. In the 80s, WRIF owned the market. The riff was solid. 24 hours of well-oiled rock and roll, man. We were the home of rock and roll, and with uh, gratitude to Arthur Penhollow, the home of rock and roll, I, I did that pretty well. Fred Jacobs launched Jacobs Media in 1983. And Fred Jacobs, believe it or not, created, yes, created classic rock radio, the format. He created it. Now, you know, I was thinking about this, and I'm not sure I've spent one minute of my on-air career without having some sort of an association with Fred Jacobs. And by the way, I was not always happy to have to talk with Fred, see Fred, or know he was somewhere in the room listening to the program. I would hear comments from Fred like, uh, I kitchen synced that break. You know what that means? I talked so much that I even threw in the kitchen sink. Less is more. Music is the hallmark of the radio station, not you, Ken. Hit that damn break on time, please. You're killing me. Fred Jacobs is going to be inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame during ceremonies on November 15th in New York City. We're going to get into that. I cornered Fred, and we covered about as much as we could given Fred's limited time. So let's just say this is part one of my chat with the president of Jacobs Media, my friend, Fred Jacobs. The student is talking to the teacher (laughs) here. No, (laughs) please. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest in the studio, WKEN, the cozy studios of WKEN, uh, where every day is the weekend, Fred Jacobs, president and founder of Jacobs Media, and recently inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame ceremonies on November 15th in New York City. Is it like the NFL? Do you get a gold jacket? Or do I don't know what the actual hardware you know, <laughs> situation you know. is going to be, uh, but it's it's really pretty cool because guys like me don't get in. You know, it's always uh, personalities, right. and in fact, I'm being inducted with everybody from Dr. Laura to, yeah, to Jonathan Brandmeier to Mike yeah. and Mike to Mike Francesa, I mean, people, you know, icons on the air. And then occasionally they give them to, like, big owners. Right. People like that who've, you know, made gazillions from, yeah, yeah. from buying and selling stations. But, yeah. Yeah, cons- but they've left a footprint in the industry. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. and they've had a yeah. huge uh, impact. So, yeah, it's a little uh, out of left field, but in a nice way. All right, 30 years uh, as a consultant, Jacobs Media, Let's. Where do you want, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with us? Sure. I have nothing but but good memories. I hope you do. The, you I mean, know what? I the mean, we greatest, had we had little moments. The greatest time of my life, Fred. <laughs> S- greatest same, time of my life. Same here. It was it was a wonderful time to be in radio. It was a wonderful time to be at Riff. Um, All right. It yep. was a wonderful time to be here in Detroit. I mean, look for the two of us. Being at this iconic radio station in our hometowns uh-huh. at that moment in time yep. where radio mattered and was a reflection. I mean, whether you were a Riff guy or a W4 guy or a Wheels guy or an ABX guy, I mean, yep. that defined you yeah. as a human back in those days. That's what was so much fun about we it. We were one of the power underground markets, one of the first, I believe. There, there, there was a naturally K-San in San Francisco. Uh, KLOS in Los Angeles, BCN in Boston, and then there was WABX, WRIF. Those were the two. Those were the two monsters. I should give some love to WKNR FM. Yes, Russ Gibb, who ran the Grandy Ballroom, a huge, huge venue for so many bands. 
you and I connected in 1980. Uh, I had started in radio in 1973. WRIF, the home of rock and roll, um, changed from WXYZ FM to WRIF, took out a full page ad in the paper saying, due to an identity crisis, WXYZ FM will now be WRIF. Yep. And it all started with a guy, Cicero Grimes, actually real name, Arthur Penhollow. Yep. And from there, it just it just grew and grew and grew. Yeah, it was a big deal. Now, you know, WRIF was not supposed to be the call letters in Detroit. Why? So back in those days, right, KLOS was Los Angeles, mm-hmm. right, and KSFX was San Francisco. Uh-huh. Detroit was supposed to be WDAI, which ended up going to Chicago, and DAI was, I mean, think about this, an acronym for Detroit Automotive Industry. Oh. And RIF was supposed to be the wind riffing across Lake Michigan. Really? Yeah. And somehow, I, I, my understanding is in the FCC licensing process, things got inverted. And Detroit ended up with WRIF, and Chicago got the much lousier call letters, WDAI, which are gone. Yeah, yeah I, well, everybody gone. always just assumed we were talking about guitar riffs. Exactly. It was always, it had a yeah. nice musical kind of secondary meaning yeah, to it. what's that great, great riff And While My Guitar Gently Waves? Exactly. And that's Eric Clapton, right? Yep. Oh, it, that's a great riff. And it turned out to be a great nickname for the station. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was really... Versatile. We did a lot with it. Right in front, front row yes, tickets. That's we could right. do so many different things. Yep. Double, for the sake of those of you listening right now, and hopefully there are many, 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 um, it all started at WRIF in Detroit. It was JJ and the Morning Crew. I did middays. Arthur Penhollow did afternoons. I believe Steve Costan did six to ten, Karen Savelli, and then I think it was Jay Brando. Yeah, and then it became Carl Coffey. Carl and, Coffey. And that was when, oh my, what pipes. What uh, pipes? He wasn't still he has. He, I know he does. He's still doing morning radio. But, you know, that's when we started doing the Riff Rock Cafe overnight, mm-hmm. which was really, a, a, frankly, a nice way for us to say, no, we play all this depth. Uh, of course, it helps to be up at 3 in the morning to hear it. but, <laughs> but uh, with, a little, yes. with a little help from my friends. E- exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, Carl was like the consummate riff rock cafe host i mean he had great taste in music and i i think he thrived on being alone <laughs> you know and not having salespeople running around sure. and all that stuff yeah a lot of people like it some people don't i like the action i like the stuff going on i love doing middays at one point we had a 7.5 in the market which was our biggest ever and it was huge back in the day. I don't know what that would mean today if if we were to take those numbers and crunch them without streaming and everything else. It'd be off the meter. Do you think there will ever be another radio station like that all the way from 6A to 6A? Uh, no, but there actually are a couple of them that are still sort of in that zone. I uh-huh. mean, MMR in Philly? They say that all the time, it and is, I, I really is. wish... I, I, I knew that radio station better, and I know I can stream it. Yep. And maybe I should, but I wasn't there for it. Yeah. And, and I, I think I, you have to be in that town for when it was it. Yeah, well, and it, 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 it's it been it like three or four different incarnations of it, just sort of like Riff has. Mm-hmm. I mean, Riff has gone through the ins and outs, mostly good. Yeah. Um, I mean, Riff, Riff has been a leading rock radio station in this town for many more years than it wasn't powerful morning presence always 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 yep Yep. which is obviously uh the key but yeah mmr has this guy at night named jackie bam bam who's just like a vampire guy he's (laughs) he's great he's he's just a real character and uh and they've got a live person overnight and and but but you're talking about radio stations you can count on one hand and the reason why you say that is because everybody else is voice tracking. That's right. I um, mean, the- which, which, yeah, if, if people don't know what that is, it's, it's just pre recorded by somebody who's got a little time in the station. Maybe it's the production director, maybe even the, the PD, but it, it saves money, but I think it costs the station and brand points over time i mean wow I, okay well we could do a whole podcast oh, we could on that. couldn't we I you know, know what every topic i'm going to bring up we could do an entire podcast on i know your time is limited fred jacobs of course jacobs media 
consulting. All right, I just wrote down a couple of things because I, I didn't. I did my show prep just like you. You <laughs> you wrote about yesterday <clears throat> yes. and Troy Aikman. Yes, thirty years. Sky miles. How many sky miles? Uh, with Dell time at three million. Get out. Honest to God. Yeah, I don't have that you, accumulated, but that's what I have flown. You've done. I've done more than three million miles. <laughs> Yeah. And do, you have, it, do you have like a really cool special card? Not really. And here's the sick part. It's what do you almost, mean? It's, not really. it's almost all domestic. It, it's all Detroit to Atlanta mm-hmm. and, and Detroit to Chicago and Detroit to L.A. Yeah. On it's, a plane every week? F- I would say 40 weeks a year. 40 is, weeks a year. Yeah. And not, you know, not Monday through Friday. But, yeah, I, I generally go somewhere most weeks. Yeah. How many hotel rooms? <laughs> <laughs> Incalculable. Um, you know, the amazing thing, though, Casey, is that the only ones you remember are the really great ones and the really awful <laughs> ones. Right. You don't remember the other 90% in the middle that are totally forgettable and, and, and random, but you do remember the really great nights and you, and you remember just the awful evenings where you just couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. You write a column every single day, Fred. Every single, not almost or every day. Every day. We, uh, well, I, I'm going to interrupt you for a second sure. because you and I had lunch about, good Lord, it was three months ago, Fred. It yep. was three months ago in July when we were about to celebrate, by surprise, your 30th anniversary in the business. You and I, just you and I had lunch doing what we're doing right now. You and I were talking about the fact that you got up in the morning. Yeah. At about six o'clock. Earlier. <laughs> when do you get up? Four thirty. Four thirty. Yeah. Okay. You said that I think you went to a Starbucks. I do. The Starbucks uh, near my house opens at five. Uh huh. And I'm usually there either when it opens or by five thirty. And you write your blog. Yeah. Uh, every morning. Yeah. Now, do you have editors? No. I mean, Paul looks at it uh-huh. before it goes live, just to, another set of eyes. Right. But no, it's pretty much me. I mean, I have guest bloggers from time to time, and I do cheat at the end of the year. The last 10 days of the year are best ofs, yeah. uh, whatever that means. And uh, on a three-day weekend, uh, I'll uh, let Labor Day and Memorial Day and July 4th go. But yeah, the the other weekdays of the year, and this has been going on now for 15 years. So the ideas, where do they come from, Fred? So uh, I had a guy working for me named Tim Davis, who was our digital guy. Sadly, Kenny, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a real visionary, and he was really uh, ahead of his uh, ahead of his time, and certainly ahead of our time. And he came to me back in 2005 and said, "You know, uh, you write these client memos every once in a while, and they're very good, and people like them." But you got more to say than that. You ought to write a blog. And I thought, why? I mean, who would read it? And how would people find out about it? And he said, oh, if you write good stuff, people will figure it out. Sure. And so I told him I would give it a try. And the question was, how often should I actually publish something? So I asked him, and he said, well, often enough that it becomes a regular thing to read it. And I thought, well, you know, I subscribe to the Detroit Free Press if it only came two or three days a week I would not be in the habit of reading it therefore I must write the blog every weekday and I have done that I'm like the Cal Ripken of blogging it's really weird you do one every single day every single weekday yes Um, I got up this morning and um, looked (laughs) immediately for your blog and Thank there, you. there it was yes there it was oh yeah and and some uh, days better than others but yes you had a monster monster blog Yesterday, yeah, with um, show prep. Yes, uh, again, another topic that we could do <laughs> an entire, not one podcast, but many, many, many. And you said that Troy Aikman was your focal point. He was the guy that you were focusing on to encourage radio broadcasters to follow what he does as a broadcaster. 
and he retweeted it, and you said you had your biggest day ever. Yeah, it was. Uh, he uh, just so happens to have about 1.6 million <laughs> followers compared to uh, my 8,000. That kind of helps. Pretty, that's that, you know, I, I'm proud of my 8,000. I think, yeah, wow, it, yeah. it's taken me 10 years to get there, and Troy Aikman is 1.6 million. <laughs> right. So, yeah, when a guy like him retweets you, yeah. I mean, that's sort of like the holy grail of uh, viral blogging, right? And and so, yeah, yesterday was a really good day on the coat, coattails of Troy Aikman. But, yeah, it was very kind of him. I'm you know, very, that, I very mean, gracious of him to do that. You uh, know. As a consultant, then, would you recommend that a jock do a blog at least once a week? You know, I used to be of the school that uh, the entire air staff should write a blog. And there were people like me running around, you know, five, eight years ago saying, everybody should write a blog. The reality is, is that not everybody is a good writer. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has those ideas. So I'm, I've kind of moderated all that now. I mean, uh -huh. I think those who want to write a blog should write a blog. And if you do that, I think you do need to be once or twice a week. But other people, I think, have gravitated to podcasting like you have. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's that other question. I mean, how many episodes do you need to put out so that people... And there's no right answer. I mean, there it's... You, you know, or like, how long should a podcast be? There's another existential question that everybody asks and no one knows the answer to there's another another podcast there's another yeah there's another podcast about the how long podcast should be yeah. but I, i've reached the point where i think you can't do a one-size-fits-all for for talent or anybody in terms of you should be doing this or you should be doing that some I, radio stations encourage their talent or actually mandate that they put something up on their page every day yeah and so what ends up happening is is that a lot of crap yeah. gets posted because somebody's checking off a box right and that that to me is where you're it, it's self-defeating i mean if if you post bad stuff if i got to the point with my blog where i felt like i was losing it or i was running out of stuff and you know a couple of two two days out of five it just kind of sucked and i was just doing it to do it i'd pull back i mm -hmm. mean if i think the quality's there i keep doing it and i and i think that's kind of right for all of us right i mean oh i agree yeah i agree i, I you know there are times even writing a setup for a podcast for me can be a chore it's hard for me first of all i want the title you know to grab them like you do so well Newspapers live on that premise. Then I want it to I want it to be tight and bright, concise, but tell the people what they're gonna get inside the podcast. Yep. Question for you. Future of podcasting. They're everywhere, Fred. Are they gonna are they, are we gonna survive as podcasters? Well, there's going to be a shakeout. I mean, there already is. Uh, and you can see, you know, so we go to podcast movement every year, the big conference. Yeah. And and just in the four years I've been going, yeah. you can see the population of the conference changing from mostly guys doing a podcast out of their third bedroom about woodworking to the suits and the lawyers and the corporate people are moving in now. So the shakeout is, is already happening, but there are technical barriers to podcasting that need to be worked out before more people because still a lot of people have never listened to a podcast before right it's not yeah it's not a mainstream media platform yet and part of the problem is they're hard to find like you said there's so many of them out there that discovery is just awful it's like a bad flea market right where right. you've got to sift through all kinds of junk in order to find a treasure so discovery's hard and then a lot of people just don't get how to listen to them i mean if you have an iphone you have a native podcast app but if yeah. you have an android phone it's a whole potchkey yep. to be able to have yep. to go in and do that so until that stuff gets sorted out as the british say uh <laughs> it, it it's gonna take some time before it becomes a mainstream media activity you think it will? Oh, yeah. You do. I do, because I think everybody is gravitating to on-demand. I mean, you look at the way we watch television now. I mean, right. hardly any of it in real time. It's all Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and all that. And I, I think audio, radio, whatever, is sort of in that same zone that once people kind of get hooked 
into on demand it becomes a thing although there's nothing like live radio i mean mm-hmm. radio does have that edge when it decides to be live so that goes back to the voice tracking conversation that we had a few minutes ago right you know if live is one of your strengths why would you ever voice track with podcasting i love it because of the fact that for two reasons i have the freedom to do it when i want to do it and the listener has the freedom to listen to it when they want to listen to it. Yes. And that's what I try and explain to people who don't know what a podcast is. Yep. I go into a room and uh, somebody says, what are you listening to? And I say, I'm listening to the Fred Jacobs podcast. And they go, I hear that all the time. What's a podcast? Well, it's kind of radio on my time. Yep. And you can do a lot of different things with podcasting. You can You can say... You have to check this little thing that says explicit so I can swear, okay? Um, Or I can say clean, or I can say Christian, or I can say whatever I want to say. But I get to listen when I want to listen. My explanation to somebody that doesn't podcast or listen to a podcast. Well, that's it. And and to a great degree, that's what a good podcast is, is a, a great story. It's like a great TED Talks. Right. I mean, people who can do that have a special skill and podcasting wait wait what's ted talks oh yeah you don't know ted talks you would love ted talks so ted talks is are these 18 minute kind of stand-up speeches about anything i mean they're they find experts and authors and but philosophers and regular Mm -hmm. people and they put them in front of an audience and they've got 18 minutes (laughs) <laughs> tops really? beautiful i don't know how they arrived at that but they've got 18 minutes no notes you can use slides and stuff behind you if that's what you want but they are brilliant and you can i mean you can just and they're free you can go you can attend a tedx event or you can just go online and just watch them all day long and binge out on them and and see some of the most amazing stuff that that is do I there. do I lose style points for that? By the way, no, no, for you're good. Now, a lot of people is. don't know about this okay. stuff. So yeah. it's the beauty of the internet, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a beauty, and that goes to the future. And we're going to get to that at the very end. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, you know, again, I know. I for some reason with radio, it's still totally in my in my system. I tend to want to reset and say Fred Jacobs, president, founder, thirty years now. That's a good ja- habit, Jacob. Yeah, well, it is. Yeah, Jacobs Media, Fred Jacobs, my program director at WRAF back in 1980. So podcasting, you think, is here to stay. But we're going to thin the herd. We're going to thin the herd. The other problem that we have is monetization. Right. So the problem is, is that... Is that... Do you think a lot of people get into podcasting and think, I can make a living doing I, a podcast i hope not <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people aren't to tell you. Yeah, yeah no it's it's well part of the problem is measurement right uh-huh. i mean uh a guy at arbitron told me once arbitron's the ratings the old ratings company that uh-huh. was absorbed by nielsen but uh an arbitron guy told me once you can't monetize what you can't measure it's a good line. Yeah. So the problem with podcast measurement is that it's it's really crude. It's all just downloads. So if I download your podcast and never listen to it, which is unfortunately common for a lot of people, they, with all good intentions, mm-hmm. subscribe to or download podcasts, and they just never have the time to get to them, you still count as a download that you listen because we just don't have the metrics and the technology coming together to provide a great measurement. So that's a big problem. And then that whole discovery thing that we talked about before. Sure. So there's going to be money there, but it it pales in comparison to to what's out there for radio. I mean, as troubled as radio may be at the moment, and it's got its challenges, as we know. Yeah, we're going to go there. Right. But there's billions and billions of of ad dollars being spent on radio and there's only like uh you know 350 million on all podcasts i mean it's it it sounds like a lot of money but it's it really is a drop in the bucket compared to radio at this point and so there's a lot of headroom but yeah Yeah. and i i I think i think about the monsters billy burr brogan Right, you those, know, those guys. Th- those guys just kill it. Right, and they, they make a fortune from they it. They do, but but it's but, uh, a, it's one percent. I mean, yeah, you're right. Everybody wants to be in in that rare air out there, Fred. Everybody wants to think that they're a part of that rare air. And another thing you mentioned, then we're going to move back into radio, if you don't mind. The other thing you mentioned is the quality. People just sort of pick up a cheesy mic, they download a free app, 
or maybe spend a couple of bucks. If the quality isn't there, if it isn't really good quality to listen to, if you can't listen to it in your car with Bluetooth off your phone and hear great, great quality, you're going to lose them. I think a podcast can sound better sometimes than Sirius XM, believe it or not. Well, Sirius XM is pretty compressed. Um, yeah. But no, you're you're right. And what's interesting is that it was just a couple of two, three years ago at Podcast Movement where those debates were happening all the time because there were old line podcasters going, no, they should sound kind of crude and and raw and all that because that's the beauty of podcasting. And I think yeah. we're at a much different place now Not where me. people uh-huh. are used to good audio quality. Yep, absolutely. Yep. People are freaks for that. Yep. All right, so I can segue into radio then because I remember I retired... <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, something like that. <laughs> sort yes. of. Yeah. It, it's exactly one year ago. It'll really? It'll be one year. Yeah, it'll be one year, October 31st. Uh, I remember it because it was Halloween. Yeah. And it was a beautiful day. And um, uh, long story short, it was just one of those uh, ownership changes that, unfortunately, and I certainly understand, it was like I was an older guy, uh, and they just needed to cut back. So I totally get it. So I thought, now what am I going to do? Now I'm busier than ever, Fred, trying to do and recreate my my life in radio. guy on Facebook the other day said to me, hey, look, good luck. You were great on on the radio when when radio was good. When radio was good. So subjective now. (laughs) It's become unreal. So here's my question for you. Radio today, where are we at right now in radio? And I'll start with this. Has it loosened up at all, or is it getting tighter? It has gotten tighter in the past decade, largely because of PPM. So we should talk about what that is. Go ahead. So radio forever and ever and ever was measured with paper diaries, which was insane. Arcane, crude, ridiculous, right? People would fill them out for one week, and the idea was you were supposed to fill them out in real time, yeah. right? As you listen to the station uh-huh. or change stations, you were supposed to write that down, which, of course, no one ever did. And so you would wait until the end of the day or maybe the end of the week and kind of go, let me see. I, I listen to JJ in the morning crew every day, so I'll kind of draw the line down 6 to 10, And all these big morning shows would get a lot of credit, even though maybe people weren't really listening all that much. So 10 years ago, there was a big revolution in ratings. And the meter, which is kind of like a Mm -hmm. beeper-looking device, uh, which actually measures real-time listening, not what you remember listening, but it actually does pick up encoded radio signals as long as they are audible. So if you're listening to WRIF and it's loud enough in the room, then it gets credit. Now, if you walk into a 7-Eleven, yeah, yeah, and they're playing uh, the country station and you hate country, it doesn't matter. If you're in there for five minutes, you also get credited for being a country listener. Right. So, so it's it's a little odd in that regard, but but what it, it it has left a lot of program directors with is frankly fear, that now that people are actually listening and changing stations in real time, we better be careful not to make any mistakes. So the music is tightened up, talk time has tightened up. There is less special programming on the weekend. There is typically less charities on the air, community stuff, right? I mean, an all-day radiothon to make money for uh, the National Kidney Foundation. I remember that, Mm -hmm. Um, right? Uh, Those kinds of things have sort of gone by the wayside. So unfortunately, at precisely the time when radio maybe needs to be stepping out and taking some risks and throwing some long passes... The ratings change, and it really does chill creativity and all that. And it's 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 unfortunate that the timing has worked out the way that it has. Has the newer, younger talent, are they easier to work with then as a result of, let's say somebody has gotten into radio in the last eight years, and they, they've lived only in the PPM world do they understand it, or do they still push back like we did? No, they're pretty docile now. <laughs> Are they really? No kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way the business is, you know. I mean, you knew better 
because you you had formative time at places like WABX, and right. you know what freeform radio was like, sure. and so you had all of that as as part of your history. But the people who are working today, who've only been around for five, eight, ten years, have only known radio to be this way, more regimented, tighter, all that stuff. So they don't really push back, and and clearly, you know, it, it's it's not the age anymore where personalities and program directors have the kind of control. You know, consolidation has changed that. So consolidation, you know, for people listening to this who don't know exactly what that is, the, mm-hmm. the limits on how many radio stations a company could own essentially got lifted 20 years ago. Yeah. And so in a market like Detroit, where we're sitting here, there used to be maybe 30 owners in town. Now, for all intents and purposes, there's five. There's five, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. if you burn a bridge or two here in a market like Detroit, you're done. Yeah, you walk into Intercom here locally in Detroit, formerly CBS, you're talking five radio stations, five pretty damn big good radio stations that, you know, I mean, are really kicking some ass. Yep, exactly. And and again, I mean, there's just a handful of companies. And so that that really changes the landscape, not just for the audience, but for people working. And, you know, the crazy part, Casey, is yeah. that when you think now about radio's competitive challenge, right, because we're, we're now not just competing against other radio stations like we like you and I did, but we're competing against satellite radio and we're competing against Spotify and yep. YouTube and all this stuff. And so what is the one thing that local radio has that all those things don't? And that's your job, Fred Jacobs. That's where you come into play, correct? Correct, but but where it really comes down to is the personality because that's the unique secret sauce, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, right? I mean, you, hey, you, if you're at the station with Dave and Chuck the Freak, yeah. that's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, it always was, but I think it's maybe even more important. Yeah, the, I just heard a doorbell when you said it's still about the personality. My ears went up, man. It's a good sign. Fred Jacobs... Media giant, thirty years hey. in the industry. Who hates you more, DJs or PDs, uh, or or owners, <laughs> or owners? Uh, or or owners. Yeah, believe me, I. Oh, yeah, they got to write a check, and they go, "We're dying, Fred. What are, what are we doing here?" Isn't it crazy? I mean, you know, as an employee, I was never fired, and as a consultant, I've been fired hundreds of times. No way. Oh yeah, you get fired all the time. As a consultant. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Hey, we're having a bad year. You're out. Yeah, uh, it's the consultant, uh, right? Fault. Or you know, you you you've been here for three books. The ratings didn't go up we're we're changing horses oh yeah no i've i've had to learn how to uh how to take those hits all right so of the three who 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 pushed back the hardest the talent i bet the talent you know the talent has changed um i hate to hear that no they really to have my talent brothers and sisters i think there's brothers and sisters let's see a see a hands no i think they're savvier now i yeah. i actually th- i go to this morning show boot camp conference all right i want to talk about that because boot camp yeah just the fact that it's a boot, boot camp, camp tells you something it tells right? you something doesn't it i mean they're down there to get better they're yeah. down there to hone their craft they're yeah. down there to really make a big impression and they're excited i mean you go to boot camp and you come away going hey you know what yeah this medium is going to go on because there's and they're young again yeah. i mean i i would say the, the average uh, well, the, age of a boot camp attendee is probably uh early 30s eyeballs are like right on you right Listening oh yeah to no word. they're they're into it i i think the program directors are really the people who are not just difficult to work with, but they're kind of screwed. You know, when when you and I were, you know, programming, yeah. I mean, we actually had a lot of latitude to be able to do what we wanted to do. If, if you could go to the general manager and kind of sell your vision, they would let you go. I mean, there was nobody micromanaging every little thing that you were doing. Today, it's become much more top-down. Um, and so for program directors today, they don't really have, by and large, I mean, we're speaking in gross generalities here, but by and large, they don't have the running room that they used to have. And so between, you know, consultants in one ear and group guys on the other ear and management uh, and sales pressures. Now, I mean, you remember when I programmed, salespeople were like, hey, stay out of my office, right? I mean, yes. right. my job is to get the ratings. Yeah. Your job is to turn the turn it into revenue. Yeah. Well, today, the program director has to generate sales because if the salespeople can't passionately sell it, the program director's got to get involved and figure out a way to monetize 
concerts or whatever else is going on at the station. So being a PD today, it is an exponentially more ridiculous job than it's ever been. Probably, I would say, as recently as two years ago, our PD um, not only does an air shift, but probably was going to six meetings a week. Easy. Uh, especially if you or Buzz Knight were in town. Oh, yeah. You know, that would be a whole day, an evening. Look, think about it. Okay. When I programmed Riff, yeah. the only thing that I really had to worry about hmm. was the FM signal and what was coming out of the left and right channel, right? <laughs> right. Yep. You take a guy today, yeah. so of course he has to worry about that, but he's got to think about the website and the app and Facebook and Twitter and Alexa and, I mean, podcasts. I mean, when you start thinking about all the different content now that comes out of the average radio station and the program director is really the content director to a great degree, it it is so much more of a challenge today. I mean, I think when I did it, and you know, I burned out on programming one lousy radio station, yeah. and that's all I had to worry about. And, and you look at today's program directors, and some of them are in charge of two stations, and, and they've got all this stuff on their plate. So it it's really a hard job today. I just caught up with a friend of mine, Steve Richards, who was in town from Albany, New York. He's the operations manager. He's not the general manager. He's the operations manager five radio stations he oversees five totally different radio stations my brain would explode fred totally how do you do that i don't know how you do that i couldn't do it i mean there's no question my brain exploded on one station (laughs) right right? so i i don't know how you do five and 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 the beauty when i programmed riff it was my favorite station before I even went to work there. It was my favorite music, and it was in my hometown. Yeah. So how much, you know, here's Steve Richards. He'd never been to Albany in his entire life, and here he is overseeing a country station and a classic hit station and a news talk station. I don't know how these people do it. Bring in Fred Jacobs to sort of be, how would you define it? Like an assistant coach? Um, it is a consulting kind. Co- yeah, it is like an. It's it's like a. Uh, I mean, can you be the offensive coordinator in this? I mean, I you know you kind of can. Putting the cliche or analogy. Look, the, what I always say is, I mean, even Tiger Woods has a putting coach. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. As as good as you are, it's always nice to have another set of ears and eyes on the station and all that. And and so yeah, I mean, what we try to do is help the program director navigate the challenges. And so everyone's a little different. I mean, some of them need help with the music, and some of them need help with talent coaching, and some of them, you know, have struggled with promotions. So it kind of depends on the situation you're walking into and, and frankly, where you can make a contribution. You know, it's interesting because, I mean, there are so many branches that you bring up that I think about now. There are morning show coaches out there. Oh, yeah, and they're good. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Why are they good? Why aren't you? Why? Why don't I do that? Well, how, could I be a morning show coach? You, you, you absolutely could. Well, I'm not so sure. Well, I'd, I'd tell them to talk more. No, I would. I'm kidding, of course. It, yeah. I is mean, there room for old guys in radio? I think there is, but there's less room than there. there, <laughs> there there's just not I'm as not much. Asking for there's a not job. as I'm much just... room for for people. Period. Yeah. I mean, there are fewer jobs well there's fewer traditional jobs yeah. where where the jobs have come in on the other end is on the digital side and the digital content side so there might be fewer air personalities and programming people at stations for better or for worse but there are digital people there's podcasting people there's website IT people so it's it's really weird the way station organization charts have changed so if you're going to be on the air In 2018, soon to be 2019, you want to be air talent. You better really be good. You better really be good, and you better be good at something or other else. (laughs) So maybe you've learned Uh, how to schedule music, uh, and maybe you're great in the production studio, and maybe you actually can uh, supply content for the website, yeah, I, I think as in, as important as it is to specialize, it, it's also very important to do a number of things well and to make different contributions for the station. And that's hard for some people to get their heads around because it used to be, hey, I'm, 
I do my show. <laughs> and four, four and out the door. Four and out the door. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I make an appearance or two a week at, right. at various things. But, yeah, but today it helps to have that other toolkit. A couple of quick questions for you. Given all the things that the talent, the personalities are asked to do now, what do you recommend the talent do in terms of getting out there and meeting and greeting the fans? I mean, is that a big part? Yeah, it's everything. It's actually. everything? Yeah. Because okay. you've written about it a couple of times. Yeah. It, well, I've learned, actually, there, there's a guy in radio named Larry Rosen who runs Edison Research, a uh, typical radio research company, except it's not because Larry is the guy. Then it's atypical, correct? It's very atypical. Okay. Larry actually does all the polling for the political polling for the networks. So when you see the oh, yeah. exit polls, right, for the primaries in the uh-huh. election, it is Edison. You know, it says NBC's polling. Yeah. NBC's polling is the same as CNN's, is the same as CBS. It all comes from Edison. Huh. Yeah, he supplies it to everybody, and then they just kind of brand it and, and chop it up their way. What he taught me about radio, thinking about it from the political thing, is that once you get beyond party affiliation, right, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm an independent, one of the key factors that drives the vote is whether you've met the candidate. Yeah. So meeting the candidate, Mm -hmm. that eye contact that you get when you meet somebody at an event and you shake their hand... It's gold. Yeah. And and when I started thinking about it, Casey, I mean, I you know, I moderate all these focus groups, yeah. right? And I have people in yeah. focus groups. It's like, hey, uh, tell me about Ken Calvert. Oh, I met him back in 1988. Yeah, I like, was at the Jay Giles concert, yeah, and yeah. Ken was so nice. He talked to me, and he autographed my jacket. And, and it's like, oh, my God, they remember everything every little detail good or bad yeah. about the encounter yeah. <laughs> and and but it matters yeah. and so as difficult as it is just like now how rock bands have to tour constantly because that's where the money is i know the more you yeah. get in front of the audience and you're good at that and you were one of the best man. well thank I mean, I, come I, on. I think people <laughs> met you and just like yeah. i want to take ken home you know <laughs> um, i had one guy walk up to me once and it was nothing i did he walked up to me, and I, I was living with a couple of guys, the Gorman brothers. And the one guy, Rhino, it was his nickname. We'll never let me forget it. We were at a chili cook-off, and the guy walked up to me and said, got to be honest with you, man, not a fan. <laughs> and of all the things that I took away from that day, <laughs> I was driving home with the two guys, and I went, can't believe the guy said that. And we all started <laughs> laughing so hard. He said, get over it. So to this day, 37 years later, you remember that moment. he walks up to me and says, got to be honest with you, man, not a fan. You know, so I mean, the, the fan's impression of you as a personality is very, very important. It's huge. And, and as you learned that day, uh, you can't make them all happy. But uh, I think radio as a local medium now has the ability to make those human connections that you don't get on Spotify or Sirius XM. Right. I mean, you might enjoy listening to them, but, but you don't get to meet Ken Calvert. I mean, it's a whole different thing to meet the guy on the radio. And, you know, the other thing that, and you've seen it happen before, and we say this to our stations all the time, somebody comes into the radio station to pick up their truck pull tickets that they won <laughs> uh, right on the night right. show, right? We have a tremendous opportunity, instead of just handing them the tickets and shoving them off and having them leave, take five minutes, bring up one of the promotion people, give them a tour around the radio station, walk them into the air studio so they can meet the midday guy. Right. It's like, oh my God, what a great opportunity to take a fan and make them a fanatic, right? Make them somebody who's like, oh my God, I went to Riff and they treated me like royalty and I I saw the jock lounge and oh my God. But but yeah. I loved it when people would do that because it kind of broke it up for me. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. There's a distraction. (laughs) Gotta be quiet. Everybody gotta be quiet for a minute. And like if somebody was Stand here by. with another friend, he he would be like Charles in charge. Shh, I brought his show. He would take over, and you go. <clears throat> Ninety-four point seven WCSX. Hi everybody, it's Ken Calvert. Great to have you listening on a good-looking Friday morning. Coming up, I got some Boston, I got some BOC, and I also have don't forget Eagles in town this weekend. Somebody's going to be bingo front row, and back into the tune. They all go. Oh my God! Wow! Oh wow! 
That was so cool. I just saw a radio. That was so cool. And now with, with cell phones, of course, somebody would like, can I do this? And we'd be like, of course. Sure. They would leave the happiest people on the planet. Ken, true confession. Yeah. Okay. I've been in and out of radio stations for over 40 years. Yeah. There is not a single day when I walk into a radio station and walk into a studio and there's a jock live on the air yeah. where I don't feel a little jolt of electricity. Yeah. There is something about seeing radio and and being right there as it's being made before your very eyes that even to a jaded guy like me, it's exciting. I, I, I know you got to run. I know you got to run. And um, I, I, I may actually have to break this into two parts, but I want to tell you one thing real quickly while I'm thinking about that. I worked with a guy back in 1974. I started at W4. WWW. Now that's a that's a tough place to start because you got four W's. And the first thing you have to learn is it's not W. No. Unless you're in the South, of it's course. It's W. It's you, W. You've you got to learn how to say it. And right. I think it was Don Schuster said to me, you go, WW, WW. <laughs> and it makes it a whole lot easier. Well, there was a guy there, Michael Benner. And Michael Benner said, never, ever, ever let him see you. See, he was he was the anti. That guy. He was that guy. Yeah. He said, because no matter what, you will never look like the person they thought they were listening to on the radio. Yeah. No matter what, they're going to be disappointed. I think that's kind of a good point. It is a good point. And remember, Alan Allman made a career on yes, that here he in did. Detroit. He, he was the host of Pillow Talk on WNIC, right. and nobody ever saw Alan. And, and that was part of the mystique. I mean, yeah. look, there's room for that. Too. In fact, wouldn't it be fun to actually have like a mystery nighttime DJ on the radio who was never seen and that was part of the mystique? And you're right. I mean, how many times have you heard over the years, you know, Ken, you don't look like how you sound. Uh, or I didn't imagine you this way. So, I mean, Michael was right. There, There is something really romantic in a yeah. weird way yeah. about not really seeing the person who you're hearing? I mean, right? Well, given the Me Too movement, and I, 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 I just say this because it, it happens all the time, guys will call a radio station with a female broadcaster and say, is she good looking? She sounds really, really good looking. And it's like nowadays, I don't think I would want to even go there. Not with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> right. No. Nope. But that happened a lot. A, a ton. And I, listen, I'm just being brutally honest with you, but I mean, it, it, it was one of those deals. And that sort of gets back to the Michael Benner theory. Yeah, well, because your imagination works much better than than any reality ever could be, right? Your imagination makes things even more romantic and 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 more mystique and and i think i think a lot of people should maybe just leave it that way hey i think i think you've got a good angle here yeah, i mean no, I here, just... here i've been getting all these djs out in front of the audience <laughs> and now i'm now i'm rethinking this philosophy well here. don't forget people at the wwf and yes. wwe mr mysterio or remember whatever the is... mask was yeah, like my right. god what's under that mask well, guys would try and get the mask <laughs> off and you were convinced it was going to be the chic or whatever yeah. it might be what's the next big thing in radio what's what's it going to be <laughs> what's going to help it or or hurt it well i think what's happening with the car is the biggest thing so the lion's share of radio listening happens when people are in cars yeah. i mean everybody kind of knows that especially in in cities like detroit and for those of you listening outside of uh, our area and there are a ton of you um, we are a commuter city. Oh God, and yeah. And we don't like traveling with people. No, we, we are uh, like we. I think we've made a reputation of being one person per car. Oh, absolutely. And we don't like public transportation <laughs> here we, in Detroit, which is why we have none. So we just. Oh no, just get in your own car by yourself. Don't carpool. <laughs> right. And and no, it's true. But but it's, yeah, markets like L.A. and New York and D.C. and Detroit, Chicago. I mean, clearly the biggest markets where the commute times are still really lengthy are like a gift to radio problem is the days of the two knobs and six presets mm -hmm. is over yeah and everybody's now got a touch screen in their cars and everybody can pair their phones so all of a sudden i mean there's a huge hole in the fence right i mean all this other content 
can come into the car now and over time it's getting more easier to be able to listen to Spotify or Pandora or whatever else it may be. So I think the car is a huge challenge and then you know you you fast forward even in a few years from now and you start thinking about autonomous cars which again freaks people out but it's coming we don't know to what degree it's gonna sweep over us but car you know you even feel it now when you you take an uber right Mm -hmm. and you get into the uber and you get in the back seat who's controlling the radio the guy driving the car good point right and and you never say uh hey excuse me Uh, do you mind yeah could you uh please put wrif on your car you don't do that you just either tell the guy to turn it down or turn it off or turn it off or you just leave him alone so yeah i think the car clearly is the biggest challenge on the horizon and 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 as a detroit guy yeah it really keeps me up at night did the car companies come to fred jacobs jacobs media and say fred help us um, not quite that way, but, you know, we have a mobile app company, and so we work with the car industry there because apps fit on the dashboard. And I'm part of this NAB, National Association of Broadcaster Automotive mm-hmm. Committee. Yeah. You know, we, we threw a couple of, uh, well, you know, you were uh, you emceed one of our dash yeah, conferences yeah. here in town where we brought together radio and automotive was, together. I loved it. Wasn't that crazy? I learned so a lot, much. It was yeah. a lot of fun. So A lot we, of work for you, though. Yeah, but it was great. And yeah. it, it laid a great foundation for us, and it gave us cred in the auto community. And so we've got friends at Ford and GM and, and all these companies. And again, living in Detroit, it's really a cool thing thing to be in the center of this whole thing so it's really worked out well i have a couple quick ones for you real quickly run down all of the various gatherings <sighs> that you're involved in the I, ones that you that i thought you said real quick okay um, well no i mean i got time <laughs> i'm not going to, i live here <laughs> how, much, how many do i do a year yeah the ones that you think are important for oh, people to possibly try and attend if i limited myself to just a couple of two or three a year i would go to the consumer electronics show which i go to every year in las vegas in january there's nothing like it so i would definitely go to ces um i would go to one of the nab shows either the big show in the spring in vegas where it's all broadcasting but i would probably go to the radio show uh i would go to wwrs too i I seen i can't limit it I like Conclave yeah, a lot. Yeah, Conclave's I, I, very I big, I love right? Morning Show Boot Camp. You know yeah. what I get off on? I mean, this is crazy, but yeah. uh, we speak at a lot of state broadcaster associations. The Nebraska Association of Broadcasters. I'm going to Alaska next month. Yeah, wow. spend three days with the Alaska uh, yeah. Broadcaster Association. <laughs> wow. Yeah, to I quote, mean, what, what an idiot. Quote Elvis, Go, going going to Anchorage to in Alaska. November, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. they must be paying me a lot of money. <laughs> Not really, but but it, it, you know it's fun, man. I you know you get to hang out with small market broadcasters who are still you know kind of doing it the old school way, right? It's it's not what we were talking about. Uh, you know, in the super consolidated voice tracking modern day thing, you know, the guys working in these small uh, Alaska markets are are doing radio the old fashioned way for better or for worse. So it's kind of cool. This is it. This is the last one for you. Advertising drives terrestrial radio. How hard is it? Boy, I'm losing my voice, having just spent an hour with Fred Jacobs. How important is it now for radio to really, is it harder than ever for advertising, to draw advertising to your radio station? Yeah, it is. I mean... You have to give them everything too, right? You remember, I mean, there was this wonderful relationship where if you got the ratings, you got the revenue. It was automatic. If if you were a top-rated radio station, I, I'm not going to say your salespeople didn't have to work hard. They did. But you could pretty much name your rate. And radio stations were making, as they say, 50 cents on the dollar. I mean, mm-hmm. a very high-margin business. It's not like that anymore. So even if you have the ratings, it is no guarantee that it's going to convert to revenue so it's become a slog. And part of the problem is radio had the benefit of scarcity back in the day, right? I mean, if you wanted to advertise in 1980, all there was was radio, TV, print, outdoor, the yellow pages, and direct mail. That was it. Today, 
Oh my God, I mean, Facebook and Google and satellite radio and you name it, there's so many choices there. So nobody has the market cornered on this stuff. And so it's a slog. It's a lot of work. Newspapers, remember? Car uh, dealers would fight us tooth and nail. In gotta the be sa- in the paper. In the sales area. No, gotta Sunday be paper. paper. Yep. Sunday paper. Yep. It's like, no, you don't get it. Car dealers are getting their cars from other car dealers. It's the same deal everywhere. Everywhere. I, I don't think I'm telling anybody they didn't already know. Nope. It's just loyalty to that brand or or that particular service. Exactly. Um, so it's tough out there. It's been a joy. Can we do it again? I'd love to do it again. Is there anything that I missed that you think we should cover? No, no. You're a great interviewer as oh, always. No. Th- thanks for walking me through this. It's you know you make it easy. Well, thank you. But you know what? I want I want to share one thing. Because I always remember this, and even though I have four pages that I typed up last night and early this morning, I'll never forget, and I think it was Larry King who was the first one to tell me this, and or the first time I heard it, but he did tell me this. Just listen to the answer, and you'll find your next question. Yes. And I think that's the gift that you can that keeps on giving. It is the gift. If I mean, you think about your next question instead of listening to the to answer. what the answer is, because you're right, gonna, you've got to audible off off yeah. the answers you you can't just go okay my next question on my sheet of paper no i mean and that I, that's why i feel like this has been a conversation and not an interview yeah, which is well, the thank which, you. which is the best ones to have so well we, thank you for having we, guess what we're 20 seconds away from one hour so. perfect ladies and gentlemen ready I, for the network news <laughs> <laughs> at the top of the hour it's time for me now to go to bed ladies and gentlemen thank you and good night thank you fred jacobs thank you casey You can subscribe to the Ken Calvert Show podcast on Apple iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. It's also available by going directly to www.thekencalvertshow.com. You can reach Ken at kencalvertpodcast at gmail.com. The preceding program is the property of Ken Calvert and may not be rebroadcast without the written permission of Ken Calvert.